fed away like bones Unaware of where my heart would flow I was waiting in the undertow I was waiting in the undertow Set adrift with fed away like bones Unaware of where my heart Glenn Feller, Conservation and Hunting Manager for Field and Game Australia. We all know that it's been a tough year for waterfowl hunters in Australia. We have some uh, pretty big issues that we're facing as far as uh, the continuation of game bird hunting in the southern states. And of course, uh, if the southern states go, the Northern Territory is likely, like the rest of the world, to be the next domino to fall. Thank you. I lost sight of him, Glenn. I had to get him up for you. <laughs> I don't know if that's a goose. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Take him. Take him. Faith in you, brother. Glenn, talk, talk, tell me about this area right here we're hunting. It's just amazing bird life and amazing wetland. You're seeing high species diversity a whole lot of birds. What's going on? Well, we've had good water in the last 12 months and it's now receding, so uh, you know, it's a great feeding ground for a great number of different water birds and species that we hunt. You know, we've got magpie geese coming over on the right-hand side here, Ramsey. Uh, nice and low too, brother. I see it. Yeah, we've got magpie geese by the thousands. Um, I've heard a few figures thrown around this, this week. Uh, up to a couple hundred thousand. I'm not sure whether that's right, but certainly a lot of birds. Ramsey, on your left, mate. But as you can see, we've got a lot of duck as well. Um, various species of duck. And we're trying to get some samples together for the scientific guys here this morning. You know, Glenn, I've had this conversation, I've had this thought. Without legal hunting, we can't be out here hunting, therefore we can't collect scientific samples. What if one of these species holds the secret to the future of waterfowl conservation? The antis think we're out here just banging away, but there's value to this, cultural value, habitat value, wildlife value, scientific value, educational value to out here hunting. I don't understand how the antis of Australia can't get that around their mind. No, well, at the end of the day, it's ideology. You know, they uh, they just are completely opposed to any animals dying, and they're not interested in hearing our side of the story. They're really not interested in the scientific side of things. If if it's pure ideology, instead of the interest of the resource, I, I just I just I can't get my mind wrapped around that. You'd wonder how a government department couldn't see through that and, and support us, wouldn't you? It would be a great shame to lose the opportunity to do what we're doing and, and to assist in the learning and, and to help the sustainability of the resource. I mean, there's no shortage of, of birds here this morning, as you can see. <laughs> There you go. 
is. He like it, Carl. They're feeding on the uh, the nut or the bulb of the uh, lily pads that are behind us, which is the reason they're coming into this corner. This might be for you, Ramsey. I believe it is. Well shot. So what a beautiful sunrise. Oh my God. Isn't it pretty? I wish I had time left at now. And you know, the city folk never get out here, never, never see what we're witnessing. They don't understand, they don't know what they're missing. I think, I think that a lot of your anti-hunters, they live in a city and nature exists elsewhere. Nature, nature itself is an ideal to city dwellers that don't come out here and immerse themselves as a part of it. Well, you know, they, they read a National Geographic magazine or they watch a, a TV show and think they've gone and seen it all, but it's not the same on the couch. You've got to get out there and get amongst it and get dirty and hear the sounds and put up with the heat and all the humidity. But, you know, it, it's a whole lot more than that for us too as far as the, the social side of things is concerned. I mean, we've got something like 15 guys up here together for this week and uh, boy the social side of that and the mental health side of that for uh, for hunters is just incredible. Here we are in the Northern Territory doing a number of things. We're um, gathering samples for uh, a curator of a museum. We're doing some genetics sampling that will be taken back to a couple of universities in America. Just because we're being challenged uh, in the Southern States doesn't mean that we've given up the fight we are full steam ahead, business as usual as far as we're concerned. Um, we all know that what's going on in the southern states and the government departments is political more so than science-based decisions. This has been going on for years. Um, these people that come and interrupt and disrupt our hunts, uh, they're getting more brazen, more bold. Because you're hindering my hunt and flaring them. So could could you please leave? Radioed ahead so that they could leave before we got here. Now, you're hindering my hunt. Could you please leave? You've just paddled through my decoys. Uh, we know that the 10 metre rule is an absolute ridiculous situation. They're not connected. They don't know what's going on in the wetlands. They never get their hands dirty. They don't turn up to working bees or projects. They simply are there to interrupt what we're doing and they've got one thing in mind only, and that is to bring an end to waterfowl hunting. Tell them to clear off. That there was the Mito Penis Brigade without to cut them. <laughs> Honestly though, how can you justify coming out here to shoot what's left? There's no birds left. How do you justify this? These ducks and geese don't just feed my family, they feed my tradition, they feed my culture, they feed my soul. More importantly, the, the information that we'll get off of the scientific studies and off of these study skins, who knows what miracles will be revealed in the world of waterfowl conservation. I'm extremely thankful to Safari Club International for supporting this initiative. They have been active in the fight to preserve hunting in Australia. But they saw the value in coming down here, not just to hunt, but to hunt as a conservation and a scientist to ensure that future generations can enjoy this tradition and can enjoy the resource. We hunters have an intimate relationship with the game we hunt. We duck hunters have an intimate knowledge of the waterfowl that we chase. We immerse ourselves in the habitat. We immerse ourselves and become experts in the behavior of the waterfowl that we're hunting. We become world-class chefs in the preparation of the, of the meat and the family. I cannot fathom a world that we are not allowed to hunt. I, I, and I, and I'm, my brother's down here in Australia they are just like me and you. They are passionate. They are all about the habitat. They are all about the conservation. They are all about the perpetuity of this species and of their traditions. 
Meanwhile, you've got these radical fringe liberal ideologists out here parading around like conservationists, disturbing their hunts. You've got a, you've got a liberal government that's endorsing it. Why? Why? Man has hunted since he evolved. We are hunters. But we don't hunt just to hunt. We have an understanding of wildlife that you cannot get by living removed from wildlife. You cannot understand nature unless you are immersed in nature. Pulling the simple lever of stopping hunting will not fix the problem that we have. The only problem that we have is loss of habitat or degradation of habitat. And it's up to us to do it because no one else is gonna step in behind us. What will happen if hunting stops? Who will take over? We're the ones that are connected. We're the ones doing the work. They're not, you never see them out there. So don't let them take the credit for what we're doing and, and don't believe for a moment that if hunting stops, they're gonna pick up the mantle because they're not. We know they're not and we need the government to know that they're not. My name is Andy Inglis. I'm the curator of the Museum of Wildlife and Fish Biology at the University of California, Davis, and I am here in uh, Northern Australia obtaining specimens of waterfowl that will help um, uh, complete the collection of Australian waterfowl in our, our, in our museum. And our museum's goal is to try to establish a collection that has every species of waterfowl um, throughout the world uh, in it. So we're up here in Northern Territories and I'm in the process of uh, working on uh, magpie goose. This is an adult male uh, you can see by its big knob um, that it's a uh, real characteristic of the males. And this is a really, really, really big, big one here. Um, but we're gonna gather a lot, of, uh, a lot of primary data off the specimen. We'll skin it out and uh, I'll be taking tissue samples uh, that we'll put into our cryo collection at UC Davis. So these specimens will be used for special units for teaching waterfowl biology and ecology. This is a really, really um, important specimen because this species is an uh, ancestral form of, of waterfowl. So it's, it's closely related to geese and ducks, but um, one of the big differences is the bit really large halix, that's, which is the hind toe, and then uh, almost um, chicken-like feet. And it also has other adaptations that make it unique. When I started collecting specimens for research, it was 1983, and um, uh, back then they weren't even doing DNA research. So I was, I had no idea that our specimens could 25 or 35 or 40 years later be used by scientists to look at um, biogeography or um, they could do molecular studies to look at evolutionary patterns. And so that's an example of, of how specimens from the past are supporting research now. And you know, when we pay these specimens forward, I don't know what, I really have, I have no idea what scientists will be able to do with these. And for me, it's, this specimen is, is like a snapshot in time. And we're gonna be taking this animal and, and basically giving it to the scientists of, of tomorrow, um, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. The genetic material that we have will be preserved. The specimen will be preserved. And um, there's a lot of studies now that sort of imply that Pay in specimens forward in time to future scientists is, is one of the most important jobs that museum uh, scientists can have in terms of conservation of, of, of endangered and even common species. My name is uh, Dr. Philip Lavretsky. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas, El Paso, where I run a wildlife genetics lab. We study all sorts of organisms. Our main passion is waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans, and more specifically, mallard-like ducks. These birds are going to be used to study on the molecular side to continue some of our research to be able to understand hybridization. This is a big one, you know, introduction of mallards, domestic and wild, have increased uh, hybridization rates that ha is a conservation threat. We're going to link that genetics to some of the traits that we're studying with these birds. Um, wing morphology, body morphology, bill morphology, and so forth. So, and we're gonna be able to compare that to their sisters uh, in New Zealand on the Solomon Islands, American Samoa and elsewhere to understand how they may be different and how they have adapted to their unique ecologies. And that information then feeds back 
uh, to potentially provide good baselines for solid conservation and management actions in the future. By understanding your species at the foundational level, the genetics level, as I like to say, you're going to be able to have a better uh, foundation to the, to the decisions that you're gonna be making into the future. These Pacific black ducks kind of symbolize what my research group does uh, throughout really the world with these mallard-like ducks. And what we do is sort of what we're doing here. We're trying to really fine scale understand uh, the species uh, from the field to the gene, uh, understanding their ecology and linking it to the genetics. And then in what we learn here translates to what we learn in uh, about our species in North America. Uh, where, again, we're kind of collecting these specimens, we're understanding their morphology, we're understanding how they migrate, how they feed, how they survive, all of those baseline aspects, but obviously with a foundation of genetics, understanding, hey, what makes this species unique? And what are the, the, the potentially unseen or uh, invisible threats like hybridization is? Without these, these types of specimens and these collection trips uh, uh, and getting the tissue for genetic sampling around the world, here in Australia for Pacific black ducks or in Africa for yellow bill ducks or, or in North America for, uh, for our wild mallards, each specimen tells a story and, and that story allows us to better understand what is occurring for the, to the species today and into the future. So why, sh why should a duck hunter from Mississippi care about hunting in Australia? What, what, what does a, a deer hunter in Texas care about hunting in Australia? Why should we care? It's because anti-hunters are united globally in a way that we hunters are not. The anti-hunting movement in Australia is being financed by anti-hunters in other countries. You better believe when the Australia domino falls, they're gonna collect their forces, they're gonna to move to another country. How long is it before they're sitting in your backyard trying to shut down your hunting? <laughs>